Well, good evening. Welcome to Hope and Change, a conversation on the Obama presidency. I want to give a shout out not only to our, law, uh, our live audience that's here today, but also to the folks who might be watching us via the web. Uh, this is brought to you by BU Today, and you could see it live as on Ustream. Uh, you can also see it through BU Today. And I want to suggest, as you're watching this, students, I hope that what you'll do is write into BU Today and give them some other suggestions for ways that we can do a similar kind of thing. Uh, tonight, we're going to get a couple of students. We're going to get a professor, even a dean up here, talk a little bit about President Obama, what his scorecard might be, and any other tantalizing questions we can think of for them. We also will take questions via the web. If you know what a hashtag is, go hashtag BUChat, and we will make sure that we also look uh, to make sure to get your questions in there too. We'll also monitor the Ustream feed as well and ask uh, the, some of those questions or incorporate those comments too. Before we begin, we want to actually begin with another videotape. This one's done by Sandy Hooper and R.D. Saul, just to give you an overview. So help you God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. January 20th, 2009, a headline and history. Barack Obama takes the oath of office and becomes the nation's first African-American president. On this day, we come to proclaim an end to the petty grievances and false promises, the recriminations and worn out dogmas that for far too long have strangled our politics. Now, three years after his election, gridlock grips Washington and Obama faces a tough campaign for a second term. About half of voters disapprove of his job performance. Three-fourths think the country's on the wrong track. Republicans see opportunity. News is the cake is baked. Barack Obama will be a one-term president. There's no question about this. One year out, the Republican nomination race is raucous and undecided. But the campaign so is look, coming into focus. This is an American Jobs Act. It's not the Democratic Jobs Act. It's not the Republican Jobs Act. It's the American Jobs Act. We need to pass it. The top issue, jobs. Unemployment remains stuck at 9%. The president's $447 billion jobs plan has gone nowhere on Capitol they Hill. Borrowed. They borrowed. They spent. They overregulated, and all of those policies are in place, and you can see how much it's done for the economy. Also in the mix, the battle over deficits, spending, and taxes. The super committee was a super flop. What's most disappointing about that is that our president has had no involvement with the process. I will veto any effort to get rid of those automatic spending cuts to domestic and defense spending. There will be no easy off-ramps on this one. And don't forget health care. Today, after all the votes have been tallied, health insurance reform becomes law in the United States of America. Republicans vow to overturn what they call Obamacare. The Supreme Court may beat them to it. The court will decide its constitutionality just months before the election. I determined that we had enough intelligence to take action and authorized an operation to get Osama bin Laden and bring him to justice. Obama got Osama bin Laden. That, plus the withdrawal from Iraq, the drawdown in Afghanistan, and the Arab Spring should help the president make a strong case on foreign policy. But polling shows it's not among voters' top concerns. Obama enters the campaign with the power of incumbency. Only two presidents have been denied second terms in the last 30 years. Even so, he'll have to rekindle the fire that drove his 2008 campaign, especially among young people. Voters, after all, make choices with their heads and their hearts. The president laid out the challenge after last year's congressional elections. I think the overwhelming message uh, that I hear from the voters is that we want everybody to act responsibly in Washington. Uh, we want you to work harder to arrive at consensus. Uh, we want you to focus completely on jobs and the economy and growing it uh, so that uh, we're ensuring a better future for our children uh, and our grandchildren. 
So, starting off from uh, your left, uh, we are starting with our Dean of the College of Communication, Tom Fiedler. Uh, he just told me this really interesting thing. First off, he let me in on how old he was. Uh, he's been covering presidential races way back to 1972. Wow, wow. Some of us weren't born. I wasn't back then. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was. I was joking. In fact, I might have voted back then. Uh, next to him is Tabitha Watson. Tabitha Watson joins us as a student who is not only in the College of Communication, uh, but she is also studying political science. And my understanding is you're minoring in Spanish. And you are from the hometown, right? Illinois. Yes, right. <laughs> right. Very good. Sitting next to Tabitha is uh, Professor Robert Zelnick. He is a professor of journalism over in the College of Communication. I bet you've covered a little bit of this uh, here and there too, Professor Zelnick. I was fortunate in doing that. All right. And also joining us is Crystal Burrell from my hometown, Brooklyn, New York. She's a sophomore in the College of Arts and Sciences. All right, so I'm going to start with the very first question, see if we can get this rolling. If we're going to do grading, any good student knows that you've got to have a syllabus, you've got to have a basis, you've got to know how we're grading. So, Tom, let's start with you. If you've got to grade the president, what's the basis for how you're going to grade this guy? I'm going to duck the question a little bit, but uh, the basis for the grading would uh, largely be his performance against those issues that are critically important to, uh, to Americans. And um, probably secondarily, he would be graded against the promises that he made in the 2008 election. Did he fulfill those promises? Uh, but what so often happens is the issues that were, I think, uppermost in a lot of people's minds going into the 2008 campaign very quickly were pushed off, uh, uh, really off of the agenda by events that overtook uh, newly elected President Obama, first and foremost would be the economy. It was r literally only months before the president was sworn in that we saw the collapse of the, uh, a near collapse of the banking system, certainly the collapse of mortgages. And uh, so all of a sudden he was confronted with handling an issue, probably the greatest financial crisis that the country faced since the Great Depression. So uh, that wasn't an issue that I think people thought much about, and yet it is going to be the issue that most likely will drive their, uh, their decision making next uh, November. Tabitha, did you vote in the last election? I did. You did. Okay. So as we look at things right now, you've got a perspective as a voter, uh, and especially one of those young voters that apparently propelled this guy to a, a victory. Um, so what do you grade him on? You got four years to look at him. What are you looking at now in terms of how well he did? Definitely. Um, I would say my grading would be on the potential of his um, plans. I think a lot of this, his programs and his obligations are pretty much, you're not going to pretty much see within his term right now. I think a lot of it may be after his, like either term ends or whether or not he's in the second term. So um, half of my grading as well will also be whether or not he kept his promises and what he said at the beginning of the um, term as well, which will probably lower the grade. Um, to ask for a direct grade, I would say B or B plus probably. Oh, you're going right to it, right there, right? Okay. <laughs> Professor Zellick. Well, it's an interesting question, and I thought of it in terms of not rating Obama after uh, two years, but how would we look at a president whose term is complete? This is a great academic game. Who were the great presidents in American history? Washington, Jefferson, uh, Lincoln, of course, FDR, then their categories were below that. and. And I think that we have to ask ourselves, number one, how significant was his election in its own terms? In that respect, I think Obama's election was fantastically important because it broke a very important color line in American politics. Secondly, how has he addressed the major problems, particularly economic, with which he's been confronted? I would give him low marks on that and low end sinking because he, he did absolutely nothing during the crisis meetings that uh, members of the uh, two parties convened in order to uh, come up with a policy that addressed the huge deficit and without uh, increasing unemployment. So I would uh, say that Obama at this point is a disappointment to me, and uh, I can think of a lot of Republicans on that list of eight or nine that I wouldn't vote for even given Obama's performance, but I can think of one or two that I would vote for if, if he gets the nomination. Okay. 
we'll get back to some of that. Crystal, did you vote in the last election? I wasn't old enough to vote in you the last election. You weren't old election. enough, all right. So, um, so he was playing to someone like you. you. You'll be able to vote in this election. Yes. All right, so uh, what are you basing this on in terms of doing an evaluation of someone who's been in the job and now moving forward? I think any grade should be based on effort and execution. I would give him an A for effort because right now he's trying to do a lot with promoting jobs and um, lowering students' interest rates, and it's just it's, he's meeting a lot of opposition for that. But A for effort, B minus for execution, because I don't think he's doing as much as he should as president to sort of fight the opposition that he's getting from the conservative party. So one of the things that certainly came up, and the very first thing I heard in the video that we saw earlier was uh, the first African-American president. And uh, Professor Zelnick, you referred to this just a little bit. Is that really important uh, when we look at the evaluation of this president? I, I think it's uh, important because it, it happened and because it hadn't happened in a couple of hundred years that this country was a free and independent nation. Uh, I think it was a uh, part, uh, a, a uh, residue of the disgrace of uh, slavery. I think it was uh, a residue to some extent of the uh, century of segregation in the South. But uh, now it's over. Uh, just as the election of John Kennedy in 1960 put the first Catholic in, the uh, the White House, and now we no longer think about uh, whether a candidate is Catholic or Protestant. Uh, and I hope that uh, Obama's election signals that we don't judge a person by his color or a candidate by his color. And that is a very significant step in American politics. If if I can add uh, to that. Uh can I do think it's uh, it's relevant in a in perhaps a, a, a slightly a different sense. I I picked this up uh, from going through old files. This is the collection of what were front pages on uh, no, the election day in 2008. And you go through the front pages of newspapers in the United States, in Europe, and other countries. And invariably, the word that you heard over and over again was historic, what a historic victory it was. And there's no question that it's historic for, uh, for the reasons that you mentioned, uh, Bob. But uh, it also, I think uh, those of us who were there remember what happened on election night in 2008. It was, um, uh, at least in my lifetime, a, um, uh, an unparalleled outpouring of jubilation on his election, the, part, the people who supported him took to the street there was celebration um, like we had not seen in American politics, certainly in uh, several generations, perhaps since uh, Theodore Roosevelt's re-election. And um, so what Theodore happened, Roosevelt's re-election. I'm, I'm sorry, Franklin Roosevelt's re-election. So I think what happened um, there was, yes, this was historic, and, uh, uh, and clearly race was a part of it, but it also set the expectations for performance at an, an un, perhaps an unattainably high level because people felt so much that this was historic. They also had extraordinary expectations of how he would be able to handle what were some really complicated problems. So all of a sudden, this, um, the jubilation and the hope um, collided with the reality of making change. And making change is very, very difficult especially in a situation after 2010 when the opposition found a way to put a wrench in the gears and essentially stop his ability to go forward. So, um, so I think part of it, the, the, uh, the, the jubilation of 2008, the fact that it was historic, created what may be the disillusionment that a lot of people and young people have today. They expected so much and it was almost impossible for anyone to deliver. I'm going to go to a question that we got from online, and I want to remind folks that if you want to submit a question, hashtag BU Chats, and certainly anyone in the audience, feel free to put your hand up. We'll get you in the conversation. Kira. Uh, so Hello. Yes. Um, so this question came from Twitter, and I think it ties in nicely to what Dean Fiedler was just talking about. Um, the idea of change brought excitement to the election in, in 08, but four years later, what will get young voters excited again? Crystal, let's go with you. First time voter, what's gonna excite you here? Well, I'm graduating in about 
two and a half years. So jobs, jobs, jobs. I think, if anything, our generation has proven that we're not going to just sit and set up with a status quo. I mean, Occupy X has become this massive movement. And whether or not people agree with it or disagree with it, it's happening and it's live. So I think young people dominating that are telling Obama that in order to get their votes, he needs to stimulate the economy in a way that benefits young people who are graduating college and graduating in really high numbers, only to find very minimum employment. So if he wants their, their support, he's going to need to figure out some way to get jobs flowing. Tabitha, I've heard some folks say, I'm staying home this time. You're going to stay home? What's going to get you motivated to do this? I mean, I definitely agree. I think jobs is definitely the number one issue with people my age. I'm going to graduate this year, and that's probably the number one concern I have is with the economy and what to do with myself and my friends as well. Um, I think as well with him, he, he had a great media presence with his first election. I think, I, I mean, he was all over YouTube, with Twitter. I think he's used, he, he used social media to his advantage, and I think that this time it's not going to be a, as much as a deploy for people or a catch for um, people my age, I think he's going to have to really set down some, some boundaries or even some plans to really help the economy in order to get us attention again. What's going to make you say, nope, not good enough? What are you looking for? I, I mean, guess, what's going to make you not be motivated? Exactly. What, what are you going to need to pull you out, get you up on November 5th or 6th? By not really defining change with this term. I think it was one of those words that sounded really great and was really like motivational for people. But if you really ask yourself what was changed, we really don't know. It's just a completely different you know, administration from Bush, and so it worked out for everybody. For this time, he's going to have to really define it for me. I need to know exactly what's going to be changed and how it's going to be changed, and even put a timeline on it so I can understand what I'm expecting and when, what years it will you know, be implemented. So Crystal, you know, the Occupy X people, those are his people out there. Should he just go put his arm around them, own them? chat with them a little bit? Do I bit. think he should own them? Yeah, those are his people out there. <laughs> Everywhere across the country, these are his people. In other words, should he take responsibility for something happening? Example, mm -hmm. UC Davis, pepper spraying people's faces. Get out if there, he... support these people, pull in their ideas, get them involved. The problem... And say, I need your vote, because that's where it's at, because if they don't vote for me... Well, if, he, if he had a bill that he backed instead of uh, tossing it up to Capitol Hill and going out to to tell everybody how hard he's working, uh, he might be in better shape politically. But he does have a bill, the jobs bill, which Congress has locked up and refused to he has on. He has a jobs bill, but he doesn't have uh, an, an anti-deficit uh, uh, bill. He didn't even have, when you, look, when you look at it closely, he didn't even have an Obamacare bill. He had a broad outline that he sent up to Capitol Hill. He didn't have... Uh, one one bill after another. Why is he out now trying to set one group of taxpayers against another or group of citizens against another when he could easily have reconciled the differences on Capitol Hill and the crisis that we've just just passed? Well, I, I, first of all, I don't think he could easily have reconciled the differences on Capitol Hill. The Republican majority in, uh, in the Republican minority in the uh, in the Senate, it's uh, it's now uh, it, it, it is now determined that it is going to do nothing at all to uh, uh, enable President Obama to get any legislation through, whether uh, it jobs bill or anything, because a, a failed presidency is their only hope for uh, winning in 2012. Now, Dean Fee, well, they, you know, some folks will say that uh, the Democrats are also uh, intent on doing absolutely nothing, too, as well. Um, does, does this guy need sort of his own Huey Long or his own kind of person in his own party to uh, pull out the vote, to, to motivate people and to motivate the right kinds of people? Does he need a good populace and a good, loud, strong, wrong, out of control for person to be a right. shill for him a little bit? Well, I don't know that he needs somebody else. He does need to lose his temper. I think that's right now, the, uh, the no drama Obama uh, persona <laughs> that he has had now for three years is not going to get him uh, at least it, it's not going to make his reelection easy. I think what he needs to do to be successful is uh, he's got to do what Harry Truman did in 1948 when everybody wrote off Harry Truman, is he turned the election against Congress. He ran against the do-nothing Congress of, of uh, 1948, which was also Republican dominated and also refused to do anything to, uh, in the area of social services for the returning veterans and others. Um, 
Truman got angry, and um, uh, that's, I think, what Obama, uh, you know, I think the, the old thing about that line, Bob, you helped me with that, uh, um, the line in the 1948 election was he, he got the nickname, Give Him Hell Harry, because he would go out there and he would talk about that do-nothing Congress, and somebody would always yell, Give Him Hell Harry, and he said, I don't give him hell, I just tell them the truth, and they think it's hell. I think Obama needs some of that. He needs to go out there and say, this is what has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, those are the people you need to blame. Well, I, I do want to uh, let the record show that during this confrontational period uh, of meetings and trying to come up with a solution to the deficit, uh, there were several bipartisan efforts that received no encouragement from the White House one of which was uh, co-sponsored, not sponsored, but in introduced by Alice Rivlin, a former budget director for Bill Clinton, and Pete Domenici, who was a highly regarded uh, bipartisan outlook Republican senator from New Mexico. And they never got to first base with it because the signals from the White House were, that's not what we want. Uh, the pres this president obviously would rather come out and start attacking Republicans and start attacking the wealthy people who earn more than $250,000 a year as if that was some sort of crime in this country uh, instead of something that we ought to uh, emulate and admire in most cases. Uh, I, I think that um, we're seeing a president who uh, is so convinced of his ability to uh, stir the crowd in the direction that he chooses that um, he's acting legislatively in a very irresponsible way. But Professor Zelnick, don't we need a little bit of that? Some people are saying it's about damn time somebody starts stirring the crowd a little bit. Well, they, they you know, may have. We've gone through so many years with a president who's been lackluster and, and not, not stirring the crowd a little bit. About time, right? Well, I'm not um, in any. Uh, Especially if you're telling I've the truth. I've never been considered an appropriate candidate for office because I speak rather directly. Uh, and I think, frankly, that this country is not in dire need of a class warfare or a race warfare in, on an intellectual basis, not actual guns going off. I don't think this country was helped by some of the uh, Tea Party uh, shenanigans that went on. And I think it's uh, helped even less by this, uh, these series of demonstrations about taking back Wall Street. Uh, I don't associate that, those kinds of actions with a mature society that's trying to come to grips with some desperate economic problems. Uh, I uh, rather associate it with uh, uh, some uh, far less successful, far less experienced, far less mature country, and uh, with all with due respect, I'd rather live in, in the uh, United States as I knew it and loved it and not uh, uh, have differences arbitrated on the streets and sewers. Well, we'll get back to that, but Tabitha, I saw you shaking your head when uh, Dean Fiedler talked about no drama Obama right away. That caught you. Why'd that catch you for a second? I mean, I definitely agree with what they're both saying. I think Americans want a mover and shaker. We want Theodore Roosevelt. We want um, Truman. We want people that are going to really, I mean, make, make an uproar if they're really upset about it. And Obama has been just really passive and just very, just too passive, I think, as far as like, what we're really looking right now. And as far as what Professor Zelnick said, I don't think we need this bipartisan kind of divide right now. We really don't even have bipartisanship in um, American right now. We have liberal, you know, re Republicans and conservative Democrats at this point. So, there, yes, definitely. So we definitely have a more unified spectrum as far as the people's um, ideologicals like and beliefs and pol political um, standpoints. And I think if you really use that to his advantage against Congress, I think a lot of people would get it. Um, more attention to him, for sure. Some folks will say the country progressed because we had people getting pissed off. Some people say the country moved forward. And, and Professor Zelnick, some people say the country you want back was full of piss and energy and everything else. And that, yeah, we got to bring that back. So uh, some folks will also say the old America you want to the America we've been trying to get rid of for some time. How do you deal with that? Uh, and some folks will say, too, that 
Barack Obama's not doing enough to get rid of it, and he made us a promise that he was going to get rid of your America and go with something a little better. We made bit a better. lot of promises, uh, including uh, uh, the rejection of uh, the big campaign uh, contributions, uh, an end to the lobbyists uh, running things, and uh, I haven't. I've been around for a couple of years uh, as, a, as a journalist, and I don't recall seeing a more active uh, period for for lobbyists. And hell, even Newt Gingrich was uh, lobbying for, for uh, at Freddie Mac and uh, Fannie Mae. Uh, you know, my feeling is that uh, this country has shown time and time again that if you search hard enough, you're going to find a conscience. If you find the conscience, it will the, you will get support from the citizenry if they take you as being serious and uh, well motivated. Uh, I think the presidents that, uh, getting back to one of my early uh, points where we judge presidents in certain ways and it's, it's a national, national game almost, uh, we, we look for people who have uh, uh, had a, an issue or two issues or three issues that were important to them that were associated with their presidencies and that they achieved, whether it was uh, James Polk or Theodore Roosevelt now, uh, that there are objective ways of judging the performance of a president. And I think under those circumstances, Obama ranks, if, if we were discerning his place today, I would put him in the uh, average category. It may be that by the end of his second term, he'd be uh, near okay. great. Uh, I don't think he has uh, the stuff uh, to be a George Washington or an Abraham Lincoln or a Thomas Jefferson, but uh, uh, I think uh, he, you know, there's room for improvement and maybe he'll sense it. Okay, we're going to go to an online question. I want to remind folks that we're here with a conversation uh, about the Obama presidency. And for those of you watching it online do, via Ustream, you can go ahead right into the stream and put a question down or a comment. <coughs> or if you're on Twitter, uh, hashtag BUChat, and we'll uh, do our best to get your question in. Kira's got a question for us. Uh, which panelists, if any, disapprove of Obama for what he's done versus opinion of what he's done wrong or hasn't done? All right, read that back for us one more time. <laughs> which panelists, if any, disapprove of Obama for what he's done versus opinion of what he's done wrong or hasn't done. Okay, anybody want to jump on that? We have a few others, too. So I yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if um, disapprove of what Obama has done, uh, he, I, I think you, could, you can take that from the uh, liberal Democratic side or the conservative Republican side. There are liberal Democrats who uh, right now are concerned, and this uh, showed earlier in the video that played, because he didn't uh, fulfill the promise to close Guantanamo. That is, that became, I think, one of the reality checks. He realized this was a far more complicated issue than it seemed like when he was running in the campaign. So you have liberal Democrats who are disappointed on that side. Uh, I, I, the litany of things that conservative Republicans are probably uh, concerned about would, uh, would take up the rest of the, rest of the night. But you know, I, I, So I'm not quite sure what the, uh, uh, what the, the person who sent that question in is uh, concerned about. I want to make one point about th that, though. One of the things that you have to keep in mind, uh, and one of the problems I think right now or challenges that uh, President Obama faces, is that he is being measured against right now some kind of mythical Republican opponent. There's not a real Republican opponent there. Um, he's facing what is sort of the referendum question. If you see the the poll, 52% of the American electorate disapproves of the way he's handling the presidency. 48% approve. Well, that's a <coughs> referendum question. But when you then shift it into the real world of politics, where you can't beat somebody with nobody. Ultimately, the Republicans have to come up with somebody. And then it's no longer a referendum question about whether you approve of the way President Obama has handled the, the race. It's do you think President Obama, compared to 
candidate X over here would do it better. And then voters have to go through a rather complicated issue. They've got to decide, well, okay, number one, I've got to decide, do I want to fire Barack Obama? Is that, do I so disapprove of what he's done that I want to fire Barack Obama, irrespective of who may be over here? If, you know, there's a few people that have made that decision. They already know they want to fire him, and they'll, they'll pick, you know, Michelle Bachman uh, before anybody. But um, most people will say, well, no, I want to see, before I decide to fire him, I better see who's going to come in and take the job, because the next person may not be as good as he is, and I'll bite down hard on my back molars, and I'll vote for him. We haven't gotten there yet, and we won't get there yet until probably next September or October, when people really take that. So. When you look at this question about, well, do we like what President Obama has done now, a lot of people will say no. But that doesn't mean that come decision time, they're not going to say, all things considered, I'll, I'll stick with Obama rather than candidate X over here. And that's the Republican problem right now, is deciding who that's going to be. Let's get into the question, Kier. Um Do any of the panelists think the federal mandate of Obamacare is unconstitutional? Um, do they support Obamacare even though insurance premiums have increased? So one of the big things he did first off, uh, back when he didn't have any gray hair, was to go with Obamacare or uh, the health care. So, uh, Professor Zelnick, I'll let you start. Do you think that was the right move? Um, if I were a member of the Supreme Court confronted with the Obamacare question, uh, I would uh, defer to the legislature and the White House and uh, hold it constitutional. Uh, I would never have voted for it, but the question is uh, the, the legal basis, and, and I think there is precedent going back at least to the New Deal that uh, uh, would permit this kind of uh, requirement to be imposed on uh, an average citizen. Uh, now that's how I would vote. This is a very, very quirky Supreme Court. Uh, I think uh, if, I, if I were counting, uh, I'd say Stevens, the Chief Justice, and Alia would almost certainly uh, vote to overturn it. Um, Kennedy is tricky. Kennedy goes along as the part of the right wing until some case comes along that, you know, no, I don't really agree with these guys on that. This could be that kind of case of him. And I'll give you one little anecdote about uh, Scalia, um, whom I'm sure we all would expect to vote to kill this thing on constitutional grounds. Uh, I was in an audience one time watching Scalia talk, and he said, you know, uh, this is Scalia. As I came to work the other day, I saw a bunch of pickets around the Supreme Court building urging us to, you know, change some statute, declare it unconstitutional. And I thought to myself, why are they picketing the court? Why shouldn't they picket the legislature, the Congress that, that passes? It's not my role to approve or disapprove legislation. Well, I, I just put that in the back of my mind and thought that there would be some case that came along, a big case, where Scalia was asked or asks himself to go along with what he really believes and to defer to the legislature as I think the Constitution requires. So long-winded way of saying the president's position has a good chance of being confirmed by the Supreme Court in one of the more important cases of our time, which is why they've set aside uh, something like five hours for argument when usually you get about a half hour. Mm -hmm. Crystal, uh, let's get out of the legal context. What about politically? Do you think that was a good move for the president to start off and say, I'm going to look at this vexing issue, health care, and go after it. Good move? Well, I think if you think about his campaign, he was sort of playing on America's heart a lot of the time. That was a lot of his campaign strategy. And so health care, you think about 
maybe the morals behind it that a lot of the people in this country are suffering. They're, they can't pay their health care. They can't pay their premiums. They're increasing this and that. So he said, big promise. He wants to pass health care, and he does it. And so I think it sort of makes up for the long-term promises that he said he would do in um, a short amount of time that maybe he would need a second term to carry out on. So I think it was a good political move to get health care out of the way, and even though uh, most people um, especially in the Conservative Party, disagree with it. It made sense for him to do so. And if he if he waited if he waited to, for like right now to be like this is when I'm going to pass health care, it would have been too late because people would have gotten tired of waiting and waiting and waiting. And so the timing was good on his part. How about as a voter? How'd that come off to you? I know you didn't vote, but well, as I someone who's going to vote, as someone's going to be motivated, someone's going to be engaged with this, how they come off to you? Well, to me, it was sort of all right. So that's that's a check mark. He said he was going to do this, and he did it. So I'm looking at that as a plus for him. Okay. You just heard from Crystal Burrell, who joins us along with Professor Robert Zelnick, who joins us along with Tabitha Watson, who joins us along with Dean Thomas Fiedler. We're here with a uh, live chat and conversation about the Obama presidency. Uh, hashtag BU, BU chat is something you can do on Twitter or right on the feed for this new stream if you'd like to get involved in the conversation. We also have a live audience as well, and we're going to take a question from our audience. Yes, sir. Hi. How are you? Um, I'm curious to know uh, your opinion on why Obama's actions have not resonated with independent voters, and what do you think he needs to do between now and the election to win some of those independent votes? Tabitha, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I really think his term has really been built on this democratic issue, and I, um, I said it before, I really don't think that America has a bipartisan like system right now. A lot of people are really blended between those. I mean, it depends on what kind of policy you're looking at. It depends on what kind of person will choose for that um, or would vote for that kind of policy. Um, for that reason, the independent voters get left out and they don't really have a sense of home per se with his policies. And so I think that he will have to kind of neutralize his ideas and political ideologies in order to kind of grab the independent um, voter. Next Do you think round. he's going to get more moderate? I wouldn't say moderate. I don't think per se it's meeting people in the middle. There's just a really wide spectrum. I think people think now there's just Democrats and Republicans, and that's not, the, like, that's not the case at all. There's a lot of people in between there. And independents, like sad to say, don't really have a home when you just kind of make it a Democratic issue. And I think Obama's pretty much pushed on this Democratic platform when there really doesn't exist a Democratic platform. Oh, let's get a microphone over to you. Dean Fiedler? I think they're going to decide the election. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that. But and by they, you mean independent in the, voters? Independent voters. I mean, uh, right. Yeah, no, you're right about that. I think Dean ultimately, Fiedler. the uh, step one for any candidate who's seeking re-election, step one is you've got to you've got to unite your base. You've got to get that base together so that they're solid for you. And then step two is you reach out and persuade the uh, independents to come along with you. I think the stage that President Obama is in right now, as Tabitha has mentioned, is he, he is in the uniting the base make sure that the Democratic base is going to be there for him. Independent voters are transactional. They're going to be there. Does this transaction sound good to me? If so, I'll buy it. If not, I won't buy it. But uh, So they're not looking at long term, and they don't have any uh, permanent loyalties. But if you look at the issue set that, um, that independent voters, I think, are apt to be motivated on, and also who independent voters are, but uh, they're going to be uh, motivated by, uh, did we get the troops out of Iraq? And the answer is, in four weeks, yes, they're going to be out of Iraq, if not sooner. Are they strongly out of Afghanistan? Because the, the electorate wants done with that. So I think that's going to work strongly in the, uh, to get the independents to come there. Ultimately, President Obama is going to make an issue out of getting Osama. He hasn't done that yet, but the time will come when he does. And then the whole other piece, which we're going to see when the Republicans come up with whoever their candidate is, is going to be the defining who that candidate is and scaring the bejesus out of everybody, all the independents, about what that person is apt to do. How could what, anybody be scared about uh, Newt Gingrich. Well, that's right. Exactly <laughs> my point. That's the point. Is you'll have that um, uh, the, uh, the if you remember the Michael Dukakis campaign there, the uh, the the, the uh, Atwater uh, the. 
the campaign strategist for President Bush, the first President Bush, he went after Dukakis, and his famous line was, um, when, when, he, when we're done, we're going to strip all the bark off that little bastard. And that's what the Republicans proceeded to do against uh, Dukakis. Well, Obama's going to be in that situation in a few months from now. There'll be a Republican, and you'll start to see that Republican get peeled away. And that's all for the benefit of independents, because Democrats are going to be with him already. So they're going to go there. By the way, independents want higher taxes, not necessarily on them, but because they're not among the 1%. But they want a deal to come out of whatever we do to uh, address the deficit, to have higher taxes in it as long as the people taxed are richer than they are. Strange That's question, but is the Democratic base the same as Barack Obama's base? Same people? Uh, yes, they are. And there are going to be some who are left of Obama. I think one of the things that's been a surprise to a lot of uh, Democrats is how conservative he is within the Democratic Party. Right. Let's go for uh, a question online, sure. and then we're going to go for a question in the audience. Um, do you agree that Obama's removal of the troops potentially threatens national security? I didn't hear the question. So the question is whether or not uh, any of you believe that uh, Obama's removal of the troops, I'm assuming from uh, soon-to-be uh, Iraq, uh, threatens national security. Threatens? I wouldn't say so. Um, and I, I would think, if anything, removal of the troops, I think, what are the troops going to do when they get here? I don't think so much, oh, national security is threatened. I think when all of these people come back home to a country where there aren't enough jobs already, what are we going to do with them? I think that should be a question versus, is national security going to be And threatened? that's your worry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question. I so, remember uh, back in 19... Uh, 82 when we had uh, we sent over troops to Lebanon to help evacuate the PLO who had gotten their ears pinned back in a war with Israel and uh, the Marines finished their assignment the Arafats and their colleagues left for Tunisia and uh, the for some reason the U.S. Marines stayed on, and there was a brutal suicide bombing of their barracks that uh, cost the lives of over 240 Marines. And one congressman, and I'm glad I don't remember his name because I think his words uh, were wise enough to <coughs> carry many, many of his colleagues. He said, uh, if these men were sent over there to fight, then there aren't enough of them. If they were sent over there to die, then there are too many of them. I feel that way about Iraq. Uh, I've been in Iraq. In fact, uh, I wrote an article on Iraq uh, helped by one of my daughters who went with me. and. My feeling was that I looked down in the uh, valley where we were building our embassy, and it was the hugest embassy I'd ever seen in my life. I never, it looked like a city. And I'm saying, what in the hell are we going to be doing in this country that would require that kind of facility? And I think if, uh, if we're talking about a permanent stay, it's a pretty important foreign policy decision that, that ought to be subject to public debate and ratification. I, the short answer is I give Obama credit for having the courage to withdraw, basically withdraw from, from Iraq. Uh, I may have different views on other parts of the world, but in Iraq, I think he was 100% right. So we got a little courage, we got a little concern about what to do with those troops, but the, the folks were asking, what about safety? Tabitha, you think we're gonna have a compromised uh, bit of safety here in the United States once those troops leave Iraq? I'm gonna answer with another question. I just don't really know what they're really doing in Iraq to really prevent, I mean, 
what are they doing that's going to really help our security right now, I think. And so I think bringing them home would be the best decision. Um, do I think that we're going to have a lot of chaos as a result of? I don't think so. But then again, um, I'm another civilian here who's not as informed as a lot of people should be. We're going to take a question from What do you mean you're not informed? You were in my class. <laughs> We're going As to go informed from, from Professor Zelnick. <laughs> All right, we're going with a question from our audience. Hi, everyone. I'm a journalism major, and I know we have some journalists up there. So my question is, um, what do you think the media's role will be in the 2012 election? And do you think that the media, as diverse as it is, has helped or hurt President Obama and will continue to do that into the future? That's easy. That OK, go, go ahead. <laughs> Dean Feeble right. will take it then. All right. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you take it and I'll crit critique you. Or, and he'll, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that and Bob will correct me. Now, <laughs> I think uh, what's interesting about the media and its role in 2012 is uh, how, how quickly it is changing. Actually, how quickly what we think of as the media is changing. Uh, if you look back uh, 10 years, certainly in, in the career that Bob and I have had, the media was a fairly uh, well-defined and relatively small um, group. It was the, the major newspapers. It was the networks and some of the major cable stations. And, um, and by and large, that quote, the mainstream media set the agenda for the campaign, decided which, can, which candidates would be credible, what would be considered news, and so forth. And it was a relatively controlled, top-down kind of environment. What happened in 2008 was we began to see that system collapse, where with the uh, advent of new media and social media particularly, where anybody who had a uh, broadband connection could somehow insert herself or himself into the campaign, and bloggers became important. And, and it also, um, the candidates, this was something Obama really discovered and used against uh, Hillary Clinton and later on used effectively against McCain, is Obama found a way to reach directly to voters without going through what we thought of as the media. I, the, the greatest example of that was when he was uh, about to name his vice president before the 2008 uh, Democratic Convention. What he said was, if you want to know who my vice presidential running mate is going to be, send me your cell phone number and I'll text you. And, and uh, so literally millions of people sent the campaign their cell phone numbers, and he'd had them already. Still and getting those texts, too, by the way. You still do. <laughs> and um, so, so before the traditional press conference where Biden was going to be introduced, millions of people got a text from Obama saying it's going to be Joe Biden. And that was, I think, a real cold water splash in the face of the mainstream media because they realized that, that Obama didn't really need them to reach voters and tell voters what he's going to do. He still has all those cell phone numbers, and he's added millions more ever since then. And that's what's really different about 2012, is the role the mainstream media takes is hard to define now, but it's not going to be what it was 10 years ago and probably won't be what it was four years ago. So we'll see. Professor Zelnick, your critique? Uh, in, in point of fact, I don't have a critique of that. Uh, I agree completely with what uh, Tom said. Uh, in fact, I've told a number of audiences that the most important single development politically in the years that I've been covering uh, the news has been the decline in power and influence of the major media outlets, uh, partly because of what you uh, described, partly because uh, they have uh, uh, candidates who feel that they've been uh, poorly served by the media, have all kinds of ways of going around the media, com uh, consulting directly with their constituents. It's, some, it's something that has wound up putting the media about this high when it used to be that high. And uh, I'm not sure what will bring it back, if anything, but uh, I think it's something we have to be uh, conscious of and uh, observant of. Crystal, have you seen any sources uh, that you've looked at to get sort of news, information about candidates uh, or that you'll think you'll watch that probably aren't going to be things like the network news? Well, honestly, I was just thinking, um, <coughs> the person who asked the question said that the media is diverse. I don't think that the political, 
political media is diverse at all. I think it's right and it's left. Um, I don't think there's any in between. So it's really hard for me personally to find sort of an unbiased, just here is the fact about XYZ candidate without, you know, Rachel, Rachel Maddow or, you know, Wolf Blitzer or anyone on Fox talking about, well, here's why I don't like XYZ and spinning it any way they want. Um, I think it's really difficult to find media like that. So I'm still searching. Help me out, Dean. Tabitha, I've, I've looked on, so I've been following the Republican race via things like YouTube, via satire, via really interesting <laughs> creative sorts of things. Do you think that uh, Barack Obama has got to get a little more engaged in something really untraditional from the standpoint of uh, uh, media? I'm, I'm trying to put you journalists out of business right now. Is that, is that going to be the case? Um, I'll just become a professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, what mean, do you I, think? No, I, I don't know if the question was directed at me or... Either, both of you can weigh in. I'll, I'll we can share the question. Yeah. Um, I think, I don't know if we can go really untraditional. I think right now with my age group and pretty much the majority of people now is the news is the media at this point. I mean, you kind of find out everything from Twitter or YouTube or um, blog posts now. Um, the downfall of that is that the media has been, like the media and, you know, news now has become a little bit more lazy, as Professor Zelnick was saying, that it's not as credible as it used to be. But because of that reason, you kind of have to meet where the people are. And I think that um, Obama did a great job the first time with making sure he was present in the media and make sure that he wasn't afraid of it, which a lot of times presidents are. But um, if he veers away from that too much, I think a lot of the information that he wants to get out there and his audience that he wants to reach will not reach him. Professor No, I'm uh, struck by another aspect of the same issue, uh, and that is the amount of money that is coming into the Obama campaign war chest. Uh, with the uh, possible exception of Mitt Romney, uh, I don't know any one of the Republican contenders who will come within uh, two football fields of what Obama's got in terms of, of cash. Uh, that will make the coming election uh, a critical one for future political scientists to study. And I think uh, a question that will be propounded is, is there a direct correlation between money raised leading to political success, or perhaps it goes the other way around. Maybe it's political success leading to the amount of money raised. But whatever it is, there's not going to be anything that we've ever seen before that will equal this coming campaign in terms of expenditure by the incumbent. And it strikes me that, that that makes an assumption that what we've come to believe as traditional forms of media will still be the prevailing way that people will get their messages out, right? Because I, I think about all the other forms of media, particularly that I see a lot of young people using, you don't need money to go on a YouTube, you don't need money for Vimeo or for blog posts or things like that. So it strikes me that this is clearly a signal that I am going to use pieces of paper, mainstream television ads, and so forth, the way that we've been thinking about it is the way to move forward, right? I, I agree with that. Okay. So. And, and you know, here's that other question. Uh, could a candidate forego all that mainstream stuff and still make an impact? It's a good, it's an interesting thing. And you say, no way. Disagree. There's no, no way. way. <laughs> okay. yeah. Let's take a question from Kira, uh, online. You get, you get to create the ideal opponent to Obama in 2012. What qualities does he or she possess and which candidate is the closest? Wow, sounds like the dating game. Okay. <laughs> Tabitha, start us off. Hmm. Okay, qualities, I would say, um, I think where Obama went wrong at was that he did not give people time spectrum. So a lot of things people thought would be immediate and it wasn't immediate. Um, so the ideal candidate would tell me exactly what I'm looking for. Um, they would address the issues that are really current right now and tell me when I should expect some kind of change for it. Um, I don't have an answer for Give me for one or two of those questions, one or two of those issues that um, they should be addressing. For definitely you. the economy is the big one right now. I mean, I would definitely expect them to really handle that and don't be afraid to answer that. Um, the second one I would say, actually I don't have a second one. I think the economy for me would be the, the number one issue. And I'm biased because I'm a student, so. 
in favor. It's, that's interesting because I, I don't think there's any candidate now um, uh, that the Republicans have in their lineup who would embody all of the, uh, the, the, the aspects that I think would be successful in beating Obama. The closest who would come to that, and I go back to your, your uh, point about the independence, would be John Huntsman because John Huntsman would have, he has a record as a governor of Utah and was extremely successful economically. You talk about creating jobs, certainly per capita, Utah was very successful. He has foreign policy experience. He's been uh, a diplomat, uh, highly educated. He has a PhD uh, and um, he is reasonable. He's the only uh, one of the I may be wrong, Newt may uh, have done this too, but I think he's the only one of the Republican candidates who admits that global climate change is real. All the others have all these kind of uh, funny little responses to that. Uh, but he's not electable. Um, he, he certainly can't get the Republican nomination. As Bill Clinton said the other day, the only way to get the Republican nomination now is to have a single digit IQ. So that's not gonna happen. But um, that was Bill Clinton who said that. So, uh, so I don't know. It's it, it, what has to happen in my mind for the Republicans to have this ideal candidate would be for the primaries to end up in gridlock, so that they cannot come up with a candidate through the primary process. It goes to the convention for the first time since I don't know the 1960s, and the convention would turn to Jeb Bush, the former governor of Florida. He'll become the Republican nominee, and we'll have our third Bush candidate in the last 20 years, and uh, he probably comes closest to embodying what would be uh, considered an electable profile uh, you know, for the Republican side. That's scary, isn't it? Right? Another Bush. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, why do you say that's scary? To us yeah. Another Bush uh, in the White House. That probably scares a lot of people. Okay. Um, the first political article that I wrote for the Washington Post Outlook section was in 1976 when uh, a group of uh, journalists that I had followed had a panel discussion and they said, you know, this is the year that we're going to have a brokered convention. Nobody's going to be able to clinch it in advance. There just aren't enough delegate votes still up for grabs. Uh, and I wrote an article taking a contrary point of view that was headlined, Up in Smoke, the Brokered Convention. Uh, I would love to see a brokered convention. I think it would be tremendously exciting for a working journalist and even for an academician. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see why this year many people think it might happen at the Republican convention. But somehow or other, I just feel that uh, uh, one of the two front runners, Gingrich and uh, Romney, uh, one of the two of them is going to emerge to take the, the nomination, probably on the first ballot. Uh, the only consolation I would offer, to, because I know we'd both be disappointed by missing such a great story, is that uh, they're not going to nominate anybody who's going to be that exciting anyway, whether it's, uh, and indeed, if, it, if it's brokered, uh, I've seen speculation that Sarah Palin might come flying back in and become a factor again. Crystal, who can beat him? What do you need as qualities to beat him? Well, I don't know who can beat him, but just by polling and such, I think right now Newt Gingrich and um, Bachman <coughs> seem to be like favored in the Republican Party. What, what, what are those qualities that you think could beat Barack Obama? Well, I think Obama Do you, has made. Do you have to have. I think Obama has been too ambitious. He's given himself a very little time, like I said before, and not enough chutzpah to actually follow through. So whoever decides, whoever is nominated to represent the, Repub the Republican Party would have to be someone who's not afraid to be a slight, who's someone who's going to go and be like, here's what needs to be done, and here's how I'm going to do it, regardless of how people respond to it. I think Obama is too afraid of, of 
speaking softly and too afraid of of garnering, garnering a bad reputation, sort of, and not stirring enough when he should be stirring as much as possible. Let me throw a, a sort of a follow-up there. Is there a well-funded movement or a well-funded person out there that could at least spoil Obama's little party a bit? Anybody think about that? Is anybody out there that could do that? Just you mess mean, him up. Um, by we, entering the race as a third-party candidate? Yes. Uh, uh, Well-funded or, or some sort of movement that just siphons yeah. a vote or two away from them. Well, there is this um, effort, I think it's called America Elects, that uh, is attempting to create a ballot position in every state. So they'll be on 50, 50 state ballots. Have to remember that uh, the election of the presidency is not one national race, it's 50 separate races, and we count this up with electoral votes. Civic so, lesson for tonight. Uh, yeah, just you know, keep that in mind. When you look at the polls that say Obama is here and the other candidate is there, they mean absolutely nothing unless you look at the individual key states where the race will, will go about. But if that um, movement uh, gains traction so that there is a ballot position in 50 states and they're going to have this virtual convention I think uh, sometime in May or June and uh, they're going to be soliciting nominees and the way it's structured is that uh, the, whoever the presidential candidate is uh, can be whatever that party is the running mate has to be from the opposite party so you'll have a Democrat and Republican or Republican and Democrat and then they instantly will be placed on the ballot and it'll be an alternative that people can choose uh, when they go out in September. Now, I suppose if you had the right candidate, Michael Bloomberg's name comes up, uh, and Jeb Bush's name comes up, a few names like that that pop up, you could probably envision some ticket that would have appeal enough to damage uh, President Obama. Typically, though, historically, the uh, when you have third-party candidates, they they tend to siphon away votes from um, the uh, usually from the challenger, not so much for the incumbent. Uh, there's been exceptions that George H. W. Bush was hurt, obviously, by Ross Perot. Ross Perot. You know that uh, the last the last time uh, they held the convention uh, at the beginning of the year. There was a lot of Blumberg talk generated by Blumberg himself. Uh, his basic pitch was it's become impossible for a moderate to gain control of the presidential ticket of one of the two major parties because they're each under pressure from their extreme wing. And it's the kind of year that a good old moderate just might win. And he started talking to people like Sam Nunn and others who had uh, reputations as good thinking moderates. And then a big gust of wind from Obama cleared the, the whole thing away, blew it away. And I don't know that it can stage a comeback uh, because I don't know that even Blumberg is uh, willing, given the existing political landscape, to put the kind of money into a campaign that he'd need to make it viable. Mm -hmm. Dean, Finch, Dean Fiedler mentioned uh, America's Elect. I also saw a site recently, ruck.us, that's got a bit of a similar feel to it, a little more social media feel as well. We're going to go to a question from the audience right back here, please. Um, I know a major point of contention before the last elections was Obama's lack of experience. Um, you touched on this a little, but do you think a more experienced candidate would be better able to facilitate cooperation between Republicans and Democrats in Congress and accomplish more on his agenda? Do I think a more experienced candidate could have engendered? Um, uh, or, or do you think will going forward? I think the answer to the first is uh, he clearly was inexperienced. He was, he, he was totally uh, unqualified to be president when he was elected in 2008. In Tell us what that, that means, though. Well, what that means is I mean, yeah, Barack, George Bush is president. Well, well but here's the, here's the difference. Uh, Barack Obama had never run anything 
other than, I suppose, a community organizer, and he had a small responsibility in Chicago. He'd never run anything. He had been elected to the state senate in Illinois. He had been elected as a US senator for one term in Illinois. But he'd never run anything in a sense of having executive experience. If you look back, the only other president in our lifetimes, our lifetimes, who um, was elected directly from the US senate into the presidency was John F. Kennedy. And um, uh, you could at least say Kennedy had run a PT boat. He had some experience as an executive uh, commander during World War II. Very badly, but by President, the way. Oh, maybe very badly, it ended up being uh, sinking, yes. um, but uh, or being sunk. I give it to be fair. Uh, but but Barack Obama didn't have that. So in a sense, you would say if if we were going to hire somebody for the office of presidency, you generally want on the list of. Um, critical qualifications, executive experience. If you look at our previous presidents, George Bush, for all his faults, had been governor of Texas. Ronald Reagan had been governor of California. Bill Clinton had been a six-term governor of Arkansas. Um, Al Gore had been vice president. Of course, he only won the election. He didn't get in there because of the Supreme Court. So you, you look back at this, and at uh, all of our Eisenhower, of course, had run World War II for the uh, allies in Europe. Um, so Barack Obama was a real outlier in that sense. So what happens is he gets elected, and it's like he then is going to, it's his freshman year in every respect. He had to learn how to be an executive. He had to learn how the White House operated. He had to learn who he could trust in certain positions. And um, uh, the learning curve was steep. It's still steep, and uh, and he's made a lot of mistakes. So to answer your question, I'm sorry for being so long-winded, had he had the experience we normally look for in a president, he probably would have been much more successful in his first term. That said, he's learned a lot in three years. Chances are, if he is reelected, um, he could be, in Bob's view, I think a very effective president. He could go from maybe a so-so first term president to a very good president in terms of history. So experience matters. I'm going to try and get another question in here. Yes. May I have a point of personal privilege, please? Uh, for you, yes. yes. Um, I wrote a short book on the Florida race from uh, the year 2000. Uh, I think the title of which was Winning Florida, How the Bush Team Fought the Battle. And uh, I think it uh, uh, showed conclusively that the Bush team would have won an honest count. Now, one, one thing I'd add to that, I disagreed vehemently with the Supreme Court decision uh, in that case. I don't think there was any precedent for it. I don't think there was any logic to the decision itself. Uh, justice would have, in my view, required a recount from beginning to end with every single one of the constituencies counted. But given the rules of Florida, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, that the allegation of uh, stolen election really holds up. Yes. Tuesday, I attended one of President Obama's speeches con um, concerning the American Jobs Act. As part of the act, he said that he was going to come up with jobs plus give tax breaks to average Americans. This is close to something that um, FDR was trying to implement, which was Keynesian economics, except Obama doesn't decide to take the risky move to raise taxes afterwards. So how is Obama going to help our economy plus uh, get voters at the same time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to go for that? Well, you know, I think the answer, if you talk about the Jobs Act, I mean, right now what President Obama is trying to do with the Jobs Act is get something. It's the art of the possible, not the art of, I think, what he would like to try to get. He recognizes right now that uh, that he is not going to be able to 
uh, exercise uh, Keynesian economics in the old sense by you know, priming the pump with a lot more money because he's not going to get any kind of a tax bill through. And it's probably not the right time to try to do that because you impose taxes and you could slow down uh, the economic recovery. So the jobs bill that he's looking for in many cases, I think, is to, it's, uh, it's, it's the art of the possible, what can be done now within current uh, tax revenues. It's not something that uh, I think would be the ideal that he would like to do. We want to observe a moment of silence for Keynesian economics. Ooh, uh, Ooh wow. And um, I took enough of it as an undergraduate. I was at Cornell's uh, Industrial and Labor Relations School, and boy, were we hit with Keynesianism. Uh, and our last paper was uh, almost a, a shorthand version of the economics of John Maynard Keynes. Uh, I stick up for Keynes in, in one respect. I think that government spending properly deployed uh, can uh, stimulate uh, labor-intensive uh, positions, but there, there grew within the liberal economic fraternity a notion that as long as you're spending money, it doesn't matter what the hell you're spending it on because the multiplier goes into effect. Don't believe it, kids. Uh, the, uh, there's a big difference between targeted funds and funds that are just shoveled on, on, on the uh, landscape and uh, maybe uh, another look at Keynes is uh, in order after this campaign. So what takes its place? What takes its place? I think that two things take its place. Number one, uh, the fact that we are and should be uh, a relatively low tax economy. We should uh, worry about uh, setting up a structure of taxation that encourages uh, job creation, that encourages uh, the creation of wealth, and not be too uh, self-conscious about it. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, I think that what has has blackened this this whole period has been the egregious overpayment of uh, people associated with uh, investment companies, uh, various Wall Street concerns, and I think just to to clear our minds so we can go back to being policy analysts instead of political opportunists would be the uh, the formula that I would uh, recommend. So we're going to go for a penultimate question because I'm going to ask the last one. Yes. If Obama loses this election, what will his legacy be? Tabitha. What was the question? Can you repeat the question? If Obama, go ahead. If Obama loses this election, what will his legacy be? Start us off. Obviously, the first um, thing we talked about would be the historic element of it. I mean, that would definitely be the overshadowing um, his whole legacy, I think, here. Um, as well, I think she mentioned a good word earlier. Ambitious is like a big thing with Obama. Um, I don't think he's going to be remembered as somebody who really executed what he said. Um, unfortunately, I think he really put a lot of huge plans out there that's not going to be seen until long term. Or if he gets reelected, then probably we'll see them then. But um, he's going to be known as somebody who's ambitious, um, historic as well, but um, failed in his execution. Professor Zelnick. I would say his legacy would be uh, one of uh, failed promise. Uh, I think he's a gifted man in many respects. Uh, but I, I don't see in Obama the kind of uh, fervent love of country, fervent belief in the various uh, systems, that uh, the economic systems. Uh, I think he is too conscious of the occasional 
malfunction or the occasional malfeasance of this um, wealthy guy or that wealthy guy to have brought into being an economic policy that actually works for this country and what this country's heritage is. Crystal. I think it, it'll be really unfortunate for Obama for his legacy to end um, in the next election or before the next election because it's half done. I think, frankly, he needs a second term to, to be remembered as a president that, that was successful and a president that came through on what he promised. Now, let's not forget that he has, um, he has accomplished a lot of what he said he would. Health care has passed. He captured Osama bin Laden. There are certain things that he has not done, too. But <coughs> I think, generally, if he doesn't win the next election, his overall legacy would be one of disappointment, unfortunately, which is why I think he needs the second election to be considered successful. Dean Fiedler, save this guy. He sounded like Jimmy Carter right now. Well, you know, Jimmy Carter would be one example, a one-term president, but what uh, Jimmy Carter, if there is a legacy for Jimmy Carter, it's been his post-presidency, what mm -hmm. Jimmy Carter has done after he left. He's a better post-president than he was a president. <laughs> but um, I think also, and that, that may be one, would be what he does after could be very important. Certainly nobody will ever take away the historic nature of his election. But the other part part is, you have to remember, Barack Obama is 47 years old. If he loses this election, he's 48 years old. He's still probably the youngest and most um, uh, highly visible politician in the Democratic Party. Grover Cleveland lost an election four years later, came back and won election again. He had an interrupted presidency. Maybe we'd see Barack Obama lose in 2012, come back in 2016, a much more mature and, um, and, and uh, maybe battle-hardened candidate. Who knows what it'll be? It's a great question. So let's go one more online, and then I'm going to start to wrap us up. Um, if Obama is elected to a second term, why do you think he'd have more success with Congress than he's had so far? I think Grover Cleveland was a great man. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, second time. Uh, yeah. uh, had nothing to do with his presidency. Uh, uh, he and several of his friends were dating um, a woman in Buffalo who became uh, with child. And being the only bachelor among the six, Grover Cleveland said, well, I'll take the rap for all you guys. And he did, and uh, gave rise to the slogan when he uh, finally became president, Ma, Ma, where's your pa? in the White House, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> That's the last thing I have to say about this subject. <laughs> so do any of you think, what makes you think he's going to be able to work with a Congress anyway? I think we mentioned earlier experience. I think that's going to be the number one thing for him in re-election. I mean, he was very immature the first time, like he mentioned earlier. Um, but he knows better. And we'll, hopefully we'll see that either in the next election or if he comes back with an interrupted presidency. And if he wins re-election, I think he will pull some seats with him uh, right now. That the, uh, I mean, they have majorities in the House. They have a majority in the Senate. The problem is that uh, it's not filibuster-proof in the Senate. So, but a re-election, I think, changes the sort of the, the national calculus a little bit. And I think that that sends a message to Congress. You got to remember, this is a Congress with a nine percent approval rating right now, and they're all conscious of that. I heard on NPR the joke was that there are many diseases that have higher approval approval ratings than Congress does right now. <laughs> and so if uh, President, if Obama wins re-election, he will bring a change of the culture in Congress. And I think there will be a combination of experience and a new attitude and new culture will take hold. I think there will be progress made in the, a second term. All right, to wrap it up, I'm going to ask one last question. We're going to actually give some grades out. So I want you to think about foreign policy. I want you to think about the economy. And I want you to think about domestic policy, if you will. Give Barack Obama a grade in each one. We'll start with Crystal Borrell from the College of Arts and Sciences and New York, Brooklyn, my hometown. So tell us. Give him some grades. Economy, present state of the economy, I'm going to have to give him a C. OK. How about foreign policy? Foreign policy. I'm going to give him B plus. And domestic? B minus. OK. We got Professor Zelnick, Robert Zelnick, over uh, in the College of Communication. And he is one of those journalists uh, amongst us. Sir, grade, foreign policy. Uh, ID. 
insufficient data. Oh, <laughs> wow, wow. He's got to hand the, yeah. the, the next paper in. Uh, pardon me? He's got to hand in one more paper. Huh? <laughs> wait, 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 what's yeah. that? What's that insufficient have, data? He's well, got a Nobel Prize. He's caught the bad guy. He got a Nobel. You, 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 I want you to stand there he and tell me he deserved a Nobel he Prize. He went and stood in Egypt, and, and the first thing he did was to give a, a traditional Muslim greeting. That was game changing. You don't have enough this information. Game changing. Uh, he just got Libya li I liberated. Where, I want to see where this Arab Spring winds up before I give anybody credit for bringing it about. Uh, All right, I'm forcing you. Midterm grade then. Midterm grade. Yeah, we've got to give a grade. No copping out with that. For, for, for his entire presidency? A foreign policy. Oh, foreign policy. Come on, man. OK, I, I, I'd, <laughs> I'd give him a B. All right. Uh, well, he had a little mischief in his eye when he said that. How about domestic policy? Uh, C. And how about the economy? C. All right. We got Tabitha Watson. Uh, no, wait, wait, wait a second. <laughs> uh, 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 I don't want to lose my professorship, so I'll <laughs> give him a B minus. Okay. <laughs> All right. We also had joining us Tabitha Watson. Her Tabitha name. is studying in the College of Communications. She is also studying at the College of Arts and Sciences, minoring in Spanish and majoring in political science and journalism. So, domestic policy from from Illinois as well. Um, domestic policy. C plus. All right. How about the economy? C plus. C plus. C plus. I'm not the, that mean. The economy. <laughs> economy, I would say um, C plus as well, B minus. Oh, wow. Foreign policy. Foreign policy would be B plus or A minus, I would say. He's more trusted in that area. OK. It's kind of unbalanced. We've got Thomas Fiedler, <laughs> old-time journalist, cover of presidents, and also the dean of the College of Communication. Tell us what you give him. Yeah, I would, on the economy, i give him a little bit more. And it's, it'd be, I'd give him a B plus on the economy. And, and you'd say, well, wait, with jobs, we've got 9% unemployment and 14 million people out of work. However, what we don't have is a Great Depression. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for having the courage to do what he did. He didn't do as much, probably, as uh, would have averted some of the, the lingering effects of the recession, but the fact that he, uh, he came up with that $700 billion stimulus package when he did and got it through Congress and was able to keep a lot of the big banks from collapsing, uh, I think he deserves a lot. He doesn't get the credit he deserves for that. Uh, so I'd give him a B plus on the economy. I'd give him a B plus on uh, foreign policy and perhaps a C plus or so on domestic issues. The one area where I think he really has kind of fallen down is the the environment, conservation, and I think that's a disappointment to a lot of uh, a lot of people. Okay. Why well, don't we give these folks a round of applause for joining us tonight? <laughs> so you just saw uh, our live chat uh, with. Uh, a variety of folks from around the university, and this was looking at the Obama presidency. I want to thank BU Today for sponsoring this, and remind you all, students especially, if you've got some topics, some subject matter, and some people you'd like to see, why don't you go ahead and make sure that you email or write into BU Today and let us know about those. We'll try and put those on and get some more of these on you. Uh, on Ustream as well. I want to thank the folks from BU Today, but also the folks from Media Services who join us and uh, a variety of other folks on media and at the university who made this happen. Thanks, and have a great night.